man, there's always something going to glitch in a service like today. And I looked up and saw that video. I thought, here we go. Amen. We're constantly upgrading. We got a new sound system coming in. We just got our new live stream. Those watching live stream today, we thank you for tuning in. As a matter of fact, our live stream is just is growing more and more, not only here, but also on Facebook. So we thank God for those that watch. John chapter 1, verse 1. Are you comfortable? Bob, we got a whole front seat up here, Jesse. Okay. Young squeeze in. John chapter 1. This morning, I want to talk to you about he finished his mission. One of the things, if you're around me long enough, you're going to hear me say that Jesus was not really born. He was sent to the earth. He was sent here on a mission. And as you look through Scripture, you'll see it over and over again. John tells us of a beginning to him. Uh, my son asked me yesterday, he said, Dad, what's your favorite book in the Bible? I said, the book of John. The reason I mentioned the book of John is John was written after Matthew, Mark, and Luke, about 60 years after. So he observed the life of Christ, and as he observed it, he wrote it down. So he doesn't go back and say in the, uh, the, about the birth of Jesus like Matthew, Mark, and Luke does. He goes back to the very beginning, and he says it like this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, this is heavy. It's almost like revelation. It's, just, it's catching something. You just... It, it catches inside of you. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him, him is the Word. The Word was Jesus. Can I get an amen? It's, it's, it's understanding this. You've got to wipe away a lot of your religious thinking to grab hold of this. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. And that light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Then he goes on in verse 10, and he says, He was in the world, and the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. In other words, the world didn't recognize the Word's mission. That the Word, Christ, amen, came here on a mission. And as a mission, the world didn't see it. Not even the disciples picked up on it. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, or who understood his mission, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. So when I look at this word, word, W-O-R-D, and I put caps around it, I realize this about it. The word became flesh. In other words, if I say a logo, you've seen the little country church logos. Amen. We have several of them. Amen. There's so many logos. Uh, there's the swoosh, and, and you, you, many of you wear logos. You got logos on. You don't even realize you got logos on. Amen. I, I got up one morning from a, a preaching a youth camp in Georgia, and uh, I, I walked into the to the dining room and, and the, for breakfast, and one of the ladies there said to me, uh, Pastor, you not have a pillow? And I said, well, no, I, I, I flew in, and I don't have a pillow in my cabin. I said, how you know I don't have a pillow? She said, because you got Wrangler stamped on the side of your face. It's where I rolled up my pants and laid on, my, on it. It had Wrangler. It just stuck it. It was a logo. You've seen the W. You know what I'm talking about. So the logo became flesh. That word in the Greek is rhema. In other words, a living word. So as Jesus spoke word, things happened. So in the beginning, he spoke and the world was. Let me help you a little bit. It's harder, I think it's harder to be an unbeliever than it is to be a believer. For me, this is not hard for me to believe. I, I I'm almost get tickled at people that try to come up with other ways for us to have been here. I mean, evolution is laughable to me. Uh, science is laughable to me. When I, not, not all science, but uh, not eighth grade science, but when it gets on up into college, it really gets humorous. Amen. How people try to explain away stuff by bringing science into it. So I look at it and I say, God, I'll take your word and realize that you came here on a mission and you completed it. Lord, I love you. I ask your blessing upon this day. Let us never forget 2021 Easter at the Little Country Church. In Jesus' name. And everybody shout. Come on, give me a big shout. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. When you have the revelation that the Word was God and nothing was created without the Word, the Word is life, 
The word is light. You know, many of us, we love darkness. It's, it's just who we are. We're born into it. And we like to go back toward it. But the light is always pulling us closer to him. Amen. So the word is life and light. The word came to earth on a mission, propelled by purpose till his mission was finished. Jesus, when he came back to earth, he had a voice. And he began to use his voice. And how creation reacted to his voice was amazing. In the, in the boat, he speaks to the wind. He says, be still. And what happens? It gets still. To Peter, he says, come. And as he walks, creation, as you saw in the video, began to firm up under his feet. To Lazarus, in a loud voice, he says, Lazarus, come forth. It is more of a miracle for something not to happen when God spoke than for it to have happened. Because when I say light be, it was. When I say winds be still, it got still. If I said tree die, then the tree died. That was his voice. So any time he used his voice, creation began to work on it. So it's on the heel of this that Jesus spins to them and says to them, have faith in God. In other words, you get on my frequency. I found that when I learned to use my voice, and I don't want to get over spiritual here, but and as, as the voice, and I use the Word of God, and I pray the Word of God. I, I pray Psalm 103. I pray Psalm 107. I pray Psalms that tell me about healing when I pray over people. I use what? The Word. Everybody say the Word. So Jesus is on a mission. Last week I talked to you about the garden and what happened in Gethsemane and how the, everything changed that night, how Jesus was on the mission. The disciples didn't see it. Judas goes out in the night. He's betrayed Christ. There's 600 soldiers come up the hill. You know the story. They ask Jesus who he was. He says, I am he. They all fall down. It's an amazing story. Now he's on a mission, and he's in a place called the Via Della Rosa. It's known as the way of sorrow. Luke chapter 23, verse 26. As they led him away, they ceased. Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. What a night. All night long, the loss of sleep, the lack of liquids, trials, mockery, loss of blood in the garden, the scourging, the beating, his beard plucked. Now Simon has been pulled out. He just, he just showed up. We, we don't there are people, Pastor Mike and I were talking about it this morning. There are people in this story that are on the peripheral that you wonder about. Barabbas, who misses the cross. Simon, who just comes in from the country and carries the cross. Uh, I think about Pilate, who washed his hands and said, I, I can't, I, I understand this man is innocent. All these people on the peripheral that are watching him. And here's Simon, he carries the cross of Christ. Amen. As they're moving through, and, and we realize that when they get to the crucifixion, there were two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. So I'm just going to share the story with you. When they came to the place called the Skull, Golgotha, where they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. The crucifixion, the hands that were used to heal, that broke the bread, that blessed the children. The place of concentrated nerves, they drove a spike through the muscle and the nerves. The feet used to carry the good news, they drove a spike through it. There's no Novocaine at Calvary. His back is torn. His stomach is ripped. His face is, a, is emaciated. Thorns are pierced in his head. Hands and feet pinned to wood. Amen. They picked him up and they dropped him in. And then Jesus began to share his last words. From 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., six hours on the cross, he began to talk to them. He began to share utterances. First, the word I would use is conciliation. The word conciliation literally means the action of mediating between two disputing groups or people. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. At this moment, Father, forgive them. You realize that one of the greatest attributes you have as a believer is to learn how to forgive people when they don't, when you realize they really don't know what they're doing. Amen. Because you really understood me, you would understand also, you don't know what you're doing. So he prayed for them. Isaiah 53 says of this, Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressions, for he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Jesus, on his way through the mission, nailed to the cross, begins to give conciliation. The Message Bible says it like this, and I love it. Therefore, I'll reward him. This is the Father speaking. You ever wanted to reward your kids for doing something right? Amen. Because you just saw them. They did the right thing. They were kind. 
But I look around this place and I see people doing the right thing. You just want to be a blessing to them. So when God looks down from heaven, he sees his son on the cross. Amen. He's completing his mission. He's working on this. He said the best of everything, the highest honors, because he looked death in the face and he didn't flinch because he embraced the company of the lowest. Amen. Both thieves on both sides. Amen. He took on his own shoulders the sin of the many. He took up the cause of all the black sheep. Any black sheep in the house? I said, any black sheep in the house, amen, when you're a misfit, when you, when you feel out of place, you realize that what Jesus did on that cross, when he said, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing, he's talking about us, amen. He begins to connect us back to him. He pulls us together, and then there was the conversion. Two thieves, one on both sides. We understand it, that both of these guys are worthy of death, and there on the cross, one of the thieves looks up at him and says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. In other words, his mission was to whosoever believes. If you believe, and this is, this is not as hard as some people make it out. If you just believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the scripture says that you will be saved. Amen. One man wanted escape. He didn't want forgiveness. Many times when we feel pain, we repulse from it. We back away from it. We want anything but pain. We hate pain. We love comfort. Ooh, don't we? Come on, give me an amen. You know you love comfort. We, 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 when, when we feel pain, we push away from it. So here's one thief on the cross, and all he says to Jesus is, if you be who you say you are, get me and get yourself down from here. But the other guy, you ever just known you were guilty? You ever just known that the sentence that was on you you know, I, I was, I've been arrested before for protesting against abortion. When I stood before the judge, I didn't say I was innocent. I said, I'm guilty. I'm guilty of loving little babies. Amen. If that puts me in jail, then put me in jail. But I'm guilty for it. That's how I'm guilty. So here on the cross, amen, next to him was one who understood he was guilty. In other words, he wasn't looking for, for getting off of there or escape. He just wanted forgiveness. When I get close to that time when I know that it's almost over and I pray to God gives me that heads up I've been asking for for years, I pray he understands that first off, I know I'm guilty and I don't deserve heaven. I don't deserve what you're fixing to do for me, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Amen. Because you know what? As I walked, I walked the property yesterday and I, I began to pray for, for the people that are living, but I began to thinking about the people who have passed. And I know how important the resurrection is because it tells me that I'm going to see them again. There are people that have been in this house that I have loved, and, you know, and I look over here, and I see, you know, I think about people who've been here that over the last year, year and a half, two years, they're gone. And some 15, 20 years ago, again, guys, I got a, a poster in the back. If people attended this church, they're part of this house, and they're gone, put their picture on the wall, because what they did here matters there. Amen? Of all of that. So this man, Jesus said, today, today, today. Everybody say today. What does this today do? Today says, uh, today you'll be with me in paradise. You ain't got time to get off this cross. You ain't got time to help anybody. You ain't got any time to, and this is the thing that hits me. I understand that everything you do here in this life is going to matter there. But what happens if you get to the end of your life and you don't know him? I pray to God. So somebody said, now, Pastor, you believe that, that there's deathbed uh, salvation? You better believe I do. Because my grandmother was one of them deathbed salvations. That bootlegged grandma that I love so much, she looked at me and she said to me, she said, I, I can't go to heaven. God don't hear sinners. If God don't hear sinners, ain't none of us going to get in. So I said, Granny, amen, I'm telling you that God hears you when you pray. Can I pray with you? And I led her in the sinner's prayer, and a few days later she passed and went on to be with the Lord. I've seen this happen over and over. Well, isn't it better to be young like the children we dedicate and to come up loving God through your whole life? Amen, to have a testimony that you've done it. And then when he gets to the closer, he looks at his mother. He's on the cross. He sees Mary. I'm, I'm moving quickly. I hope you got your seatbelt on. Because I'm trying to get somewhere. I ain't even got to my message yet. We build it. I got four minutes. <laughs> I know some of you just love Cracker Brawl at 1030. I understand. The commission. John chapter 19, verse 25, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, that's his aunt, Mary, his, for, for those of y'all from Arkansas, amen, Mary, the wife of Clophus, and Mary Magdalene, verse 26, when Jesus saw his mother there and the disciples whom he loved, the disciple whom he loved, who's writing this, John, John says this, you know it's me that loved him, 
Then he said to her, woman, here's your son. And to the disciple, here's your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. There was a certain responsibility about dying. I'm going to tell you this. Before you die, see how many responsibilities you can take care of. Don't let your siblings, don't let your children, don't let your grandkids fight over all your stuff. Amen. Make sure that you've aligned yourself up in such a way that pretty much they know what's going to happen when you go. It's so important to me. The more funerals I do, the more I see, I tell people, please make sure you deal with this before you go. And Jesus on the cross had a moment, and he looked down, and he said to John, John, look at your mama. Mama, look at your son. In other words, I'm going to be with my father. I'm releasing this responsibility now. That is so important. The last four sayings of Christ came from the sixth hour, from 12 to 3 o'clock. He cried out when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Isaiah 53. You realize that? In all my life, I can't never remember my dad ever forsaking me. You know, all the crimes and all the meanness and all the mischief and all the foolishness and, and, and tearing up his vehicles and, and, and messing up the, the house and all the things that I did and, and, and the police officers calling my dad, telling him what I was doing, all the things that I've done. I've never seen my dad say, son, that's it. I ain't putting up with you no more. He never did that. And my dad, dad didn't even know Jesus at that time. So then I look at this and I realize that this moment on the cross Something happened. The mission of Christ was to take the sins of the whole world. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the whole world. Do you know why I tell you do not confess your sins to me? Because I got enough on my own. I don't need to bear your sins in my life. Amen. So I tell you, you tell your sins to the Father. You confess your sins to God. Can I get an amen? I don't want to walk through life with all your stuff because I got to deal with mine. But imagine Christ on the cross and all the sins of the world from Cain and Abel all the way to the book of Revelation. Amen. Poured upon him. And at that moment, the Father turns his back. Jesus said, my God, my God, why did you forsake me? He didn't say, oh, God. He was still his father. Amen. He knew who he was. So, my God, why did you forsake me? Why did you? That moment, darkness began to move over. Isaiah 53 says it this way. talks about the mission of Jesus. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him. What? And cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring. How much does God love me in you? That much, that his own son, he allowed him to be suffered, amen, to be crushed, to be beat, to bleed out, to bleed out, so that he can have us. Now, I know none of you, I've heard some of you testify about it, you'd never give your child up. You would never let your child go for somebody else, especially not this. So you say, well, you know, I might would, might would let him uh, break a toe for this guy. But then you look at some of y'all up in this house, ain't no way in the world I let my son die for you. It ain't going to happen. And yet God, looking down, and I, and I read this, it says, and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hands. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Do you know how you hate for somebody to blame you for something you never did? You never were. They say things about you. You never was that person, and yet they say that about you because they heard a rumor. And yet Jesus is here, and all the sins of the world are being put upon him, and who he is is upon him. You know, he had no sin. Amen. He, he was mature. He was perfect, everything about it. And yet the sins of the world were put upon him that we might become the righteousness of God. That's what happened at that moment. Then there's the craving. Jesus said, <clears throat> I thirst. I think about this. Some of you can't go an hour, two out, three. Got to give me a drink of water. Amen. I'm thirsty. Hallelujah. And here's Jesus. He's in about the fourth, fifth hour on the cross all night long. And he hits a place where his body is drained of fluids. Uh, cramps are kicking in. Let me just mention this about the pain. If you get cramps in your body, you got to straighten out, don't you? I've got a fused foot, which means my foot does not bend down. And if I get a cramp in my leg, i got to beat that leg in order to get the cramp out because I can't straighten my foot to get the cramp out. 
So I, 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 I got pickle juice all the time at the house. Amen. If you hadn't tried pickle juice, you need to get pickled. I got pickle juice in my truck. Amen. And I mean, it comes in a pop. It, it's not in a jar, so don't, it doesn't sound gross. So, but I got to hit, I got to hit something. And I think about Jesus on the cross with his feet pinned and the lack of all of the, the nutrients in his body and the cramps hitting. And not only that, he would have to push himself up on that spike in order to get air to breathe. And he hits a moment where he said, I thirst. When he said, I thirst, when the word rhema said, I thirst, the clouds started gathering. It hits me just how much creation and heaven was watching what was going on on Golgotha's hill when Jesus said, I thirst. And then the clouds began to gather as if to say, are you ready? We're going to give him a drink. We're going to take care of him. As a matter of fact, he said when he received it, amen, when he said, I thirst, uh, knowing that all had been completed so that the scripture might be fulfilled, I'm thirsty. A jar of wine and vinegar was there. They soaked the sponge, put it up to uh, on a stalk on a hyssop plant, and lifted Jesus' lips, Psalm 69, 20. Again, talking about his mission being fulfilled. Reproach has broken my heart. I'm full of heaviness. I look for some to take pity. There was none. And for comforters, but I found none. They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. It's not like wanting to be refreshed, and you get vinegar instead. You get bitterness instead offered to you. Now, I, I, I don't know. Maybe I, I can't prove this totally. But in reading Scripture, I see where they, Jesus' lips were touched with vinegar, with bitterness. But I can't prove he swallowed it. And I find out in life that you're going to have opportunities to taste bitterness. It's going to touch your life. There's going to be opportunities that all of the sayings that Jesus went through, you're going to have to walk through it yourself. Amen. You're going to have to forgive. You're going to have to let go. You're going to have to stay thirsty. But when they touched him, he said, I, I, can't, I can't swallow the bitter. Amen. Don't take it in. Amen. And then we get to the, the sermon. John 19, verse 30. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed. For 33 years, led to this moment. I just want to get to this moment and fulfill the mission that God has for my life. Did you know, or maybe you don't, that God put you here for a purpose and on a mission? And it may not be as clear to you as it was to Jesus because his communion with his Father gave him his direction. But many people wander through life without any idea of mission or purpose. First off, I would say to the parents who dedicated your children, that's your mission. Amen. To the grandparents and those around, that's your mission. You have a mission with those. But then there are missions outside of that that, give you, that God gives you. And sometimes they're completed quickly. Amen. You get it done quick. But others take a lifetime to complete. And here's Christ having this moment to complete this mission. His physical suffering had reached their climax. The pain is unbearable. Breathing is almost impossible. The crowd gathers around like vultures, circling their prey. The friends of Jesus watch in horror as his life ebbs away. Death rattles in his throat. For somewhere down below, a fiendish evil howling. The angels are looking away. The Son of God is about to die. And then his last words, like a boxer getting up from the mat on the ninth count, he cleared his voice and he proclaimed, It is Finished. The, the, the Greek word is tetelestai. Tetelestai. It is finished. It, it comes from the thought to bring to an end, to complete, to accomplish. It's that crucial word. I don't know if when I get to the end of my life, I'm going to say it's finished. I'm done. Praise the Lord. Glory. Amen. But I can tell you this. At this moment, it, it defines success. It's different from the past tense, which looks back to an event and says, this happened. The perfect tense adds to the idea, this happened, and it's still happening today. In other words, it was finished over 2,000 years ago, but it's still finished today. What he's saying is simply is, and you need to note this, he didn't say, I'm finished. He said, it's finished. But that would imply that he died defeated and exhausted. I've heard that preached before. Amen. He, he didn't de die defeated. He died victoriously. Rather, he, he said, it's finished. I successfully completed 
the mission God sent me on, amen, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. The Word was with God. The Word created the world, amen, by it the whole world was not created. I am the life. I am the light. And I'm telling you, redemption is completed. Full satisfaction for sin, fatal blow to Satan, fountain of grace open that will flow forever, foundation of peace laid that will last forever, to tell us that. Paid in full. Finished. We believe that. In my heart, I, I can tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless you're born again. And that, to no degree or reformation, however great, no attainments in life, no matter how morally high you may reach, no culture, however attractive, no baptism, can help an unbeliever take even one step toward heaven, but a new nature imparted from above. Now, when you understand and you believe this, let me tell you, I, I, I'm not done yet with what, what happened. Watch this, Joseph. But he said it was finished, Matthew 27, verse 50. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. Gave it up. Finished. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. It stopped there. First, there's this giant curtain. And the priest would slip in behind the curtain and they would offer sacrifices for the sins of the people. They'd always slip in behind it. It's actually written in tradition that they would tie a, a, a bells around the priest, him, and put a rope around him that in case he went back there and God was dissatisfied and he died, they could drag him out. There was such a fear. We, we, we think about the, the yellow brick road and the man behind the curtain and the fear of all of that. Who was just behind the curtain? It was as if God was saying, Listen, you don't know who I am. You know, I sent my son to die for you, and you still don't recognize his mission and everything that I've done. So when Jesus said, it's finished, God ripped that curtain from top to bottom. And opening up that curtain, and I've said this before, it was not to let us in, but it was to let God out. So he could walk with his people and talk with his people and he could be their God and they could be his people. That was God's whole thing. But then he's not done yet. Then it says at that moment the curtain of the temple was torn. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. You know, they did not tell us much more about it. I've researched and I've looked at it and I've listened to co commentaries and, and people's thoughts. But it's the walking dead. They're up from the grave. They're walking around. It's Uncle Fred. It's Aunt Sadie. What are they doing walking back through the town? It's not natural. Was it his blood that hit the ground? Something. But at one moment, natural things became unnatural. Curtains rent. No, 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 no. You have no idea what it'd be like if somebody you once knew 25, 30, 40 years ago popped back up up in here. Yeah, I'm serious. Many of y'all just, y'all looking at me as a, like, like an old mule staring at a new gate. And I'm telling you, there's, there's something spiritual about this moment. How could you, as a soldier, who beat him, not at this time, realize who he really was. How could you, as a priest in the temple, not realize who he really was? How could you say that he was not the Son of God? Amen. Because on that Easter morning, when he rose again, even then he walked through walls to prove to the disciples who he really was. Natural things. And this is what hits me. You can't explain it. You can't explain this. Amen. You just have to be crazy enough to believe it. And not only that, you got to be crazy enough to believe that when you die, that God is going to bring you back with him. And that he's going to receive your spirit and give you a new body. I don't know where else to go. Many years ago, I preached a sermon called, I don't have a plan B. I don't have a plan B. This is all I got. Amen. And I put my faith in it. You know, the worst virus in America right now is hopelessness. 
people losing their hope. They went into the holy city and appeared to many people. How you doing? How you doing? You got questions? I got questions. I got to ask you. What was it like? What was going on? Rocks rent. Saints are walking around. Jesus said it's finished. Paid in full. I close with Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11. Every priest goes to work at the altar each day. Offers the same old sacrifices year in, year out. Never makes a dent in the sin problem. As a priest, Christ made a single sacrifice for sins. That was it. Then he sat down right beside God, and he waited for his enemies to cave in. It was, listen to this part, it was a perfect sacrifice by a perfect person to perfect some very imperfect people. You know what Easter is? It's about perfecting us through the cross. By that single offering, he did everything that needed to be done for everyone who takes part in this purifying process. This day I celebrate. This day I celebrate. And I believe that he's coming again. I believe in a resurrected Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Heads bowed, eyes closed for a moment. It is a great joy for me to say this, that I do not know everybody in this house. I've not met everybody in this house. But I'm telling you that he finished his mission, and you, my friend, were a part of that mission. You, to have you as his child. He has no grandkids. He only has children. Amen. And he wants you. And all you got to do is believe. He said that if we believe, if we believe, and you call on the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. Amen. It's a mystery to me but to be born again, to give one's life to Christ is the most powerful thing. So I'm talking to you today. Just put your hand up right now. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love you. Thank you. God love you. Thank you. Amen. Those hands lifted. Pray this with me. Today, I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. Forgive me my sins, Jesus. I understand now. I get it. You died for me. You love me. You forgave me. I thank you. And I'm going to worship you and serve you all the days of my life. Hallelujah. Come on, give God a hallelujah. He is the hope of every backslid saint. You know you can slide back into darkness. Amen. He is our hope. Hallelujah. There's no other hope we got. I love you, church. Love this house. Love the people. Love you guys watching online. Thanks for staying connected with us. But when he said he's finished, it's, there ain't nothing like finishing something, is it? One of the hardest things. Let me just can't tell you something about pastors as David comes up here. The hardest thing about being a pastor is people are never finished. You ain't got to laugh, smile, cry, nothing. Let me say it. You do carpentry work. David does some carpentry work. Amen. They, they build things. They finish stuff. They sit back. They look at it and smile. I help with carpentry work. I help dig holes. I help mow grass. I help with stuff. But my basic place in life is I've never, I'm not even good. I'm not the best at it. Ronnie, this wood up here is so good. It's so finished. It's so nice. It's so nice. I never get to finish. I get people three steps forward. Then they call me and they're two steps back. And then we go at it again and we pray together and believe God for the best. They get three steps forward. And then they get two steps back. And I think to myself, Lord Jesus, I believe this time they're going to make it. Then they'll make it three steps forward. And then they'll make it two steps back. Meantime, over here, I'm still preaching. I'm still believing. I'm still hanging on. I'm still thanking God for you. And I know that one day when I get to heaven and you get to heaven and we, I see you, I'm going to be able to say, thank God it's finished. <laughs>